Friends, here we are. We finally have arrived to Christmas Eve, this season of Advent. Uh, we've been dealing with these themes of watching and waiting, uh, talking about the thrill of hope in the midst of a world that has grown weary. And, and we've talked about how Advent both looks back to the birth of Jesus and also looks ahead to the second arrival of Jesus. And this evening, it's about that birth of Jesus, that, that hope that arrives, that, that God has traveled for us, that all of the stories, all of the prophets, all of this longing and waiting pointed us to Jesus. And on this evening, we celebrate the great truth that he has arrived, that he is Emmanuel, God with us, born for us in Bethlehem, so that we might have hope and we might have life. So we're uh, delighted that you are tuning in to watch with us and, and celebrate with us. Uh, I also want to remind, or let you know that in the, towards the end of our service, we are going to be having a, a rendition of Silent Night and, and lighting the candles. So we encourage you to either uh, take some candles or perhaps you've received some candles. Uh, get those candles ready and, and join us as we light um, our candles and sing Silent Night and recall that great truth that Christ has come for us. Uh, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness cannot overcome it. So with that sense of expectation and hope, I invite you to pray with me. Oh God, thank you that you have arrived for us. Thank you that at just the right time, that Kairos moment, a baby was born, fully human and fully God. One who would redeem and restore. Because God, you are a God of, of reconciliation. You are a God who longs to be with your people. So thank you, God, that you have done for us what we could never do, that you have crossed over and you have, have become like us. And this Christmas Eve, we celebrate that. Lord, there is uncertainty around us. We don't know the future, but we know one thing for sure. And that is that you are with us. So thank you that we get to worship. Thank you that we get to sing. Thank you that we mentally remind ourselves that the light shines in the darkness and the darkness cannot overcome it. Thank you, O oh Lord, for the gift of Jesus in whose name we pray, amen. Tonight we light the white Christ candle for Jesus, the light of the world. Please pray with us. Our Father, thank you for the gift of life, and thank you for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, and all he gives it to us, hope, peace, joy, and love. In the holy and wonderful name of Jesus, amen. From Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, we read, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, 
Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. All the preparation and waiting for this night has brought us here. The time when God's greatest gift to us in the form of a little baby is given to us at Bethlehem. The gift of his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. John 8, 12. Merry Christmas Eve to all of you online worshipers. I'm Scott Mitchell, one of the pastors here on staff at La Jolla Presbyterian Church, and we're so glad you're worshiping with us on this night before Christmas, the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. There are a lot of things going on in the life of LJPC. If you'd like to know more about them, you can check out uh, your email for church news or Zoom details, or you can go onto our website, ljpress.org, or you can uh, go onto our church Facebook page. Do know that this coming Sunday, December 27th, we'll be having one traditional worship service in person at 9.30 a.m. in the courtyard. You can sign up for in-person worship at ljpress.org slash rsvp. That service will also be available online, either contemporary or traditional. And whether in person or online, though, we look forward to worshiping with you on December 27th. Come the new year, Pastor Paul will be starting a new sermon series on the book of Psalms. 
There will be growth groups and many other things. So we hope you'll get involved in those many other ways to grow in your faith in Jesus Christ. Folks, what a year we've had, right? But as difficult as it's been, and in so many ways it's been difficult, we are so thankful for you being such an incredible blessing to God's kingdom work here in La Jolla and around the world. Your faithful generosity enables LJPC to continue doing mission and program ministry, and we thank you so much for that. So uh, there are only a few days left until the end of 2020. Thank the Lord for that. And so your gifts are especially important at this time of the year. So don't forget that you can give your tithes or your gifts either online or by mail. And again, thank you for your generosity in 2020. Well, those are just some of the things that are happening in the life of La Jolla Presbyterian Church. There are many more. So if you'd like to know more about them after the service, you can check out our website, ljpress.org. Folks, let's come before our Lord this evening for a time of prayer. Pray with me now. Faithful God of Christmas, we praise your name for bringing us to this time of worship together. And we praise you for the ancient matters, the deep matters that have brought us here into your presence this night. You bring your son into our world, into a country taken over by an occupying empire. A new baby, yet a king, is born into a nation where worldly kings fret and plot to overthrow that king. But your good news travels on. Lord, in our world lately, we have been prevented from traveling for much of this year. And yet then as now, your unstoppable will continues up to and including this very moment. Angels and shepherds were on the move to announce and celebrate your arrival, O God. And so too, we announce and celebrate that you are here to save our world. Then as now, Lord, there is much saving still to be done, much solace still to be given, much comfort and generosity still to be distributed to those we know and those we don't know. Yet then as now, you, Lord, know all of our needs. You always have. You know who has joy and who is weeping. Father, as you know all things, if we have joy to give, reveal to us those in tears who have need of our joy. And if we ourselves have shed tears lately, by your Holy Spirit, bring to us that person who can console us and then restore our own joy. Ultimately, Lord Jesus, then as now, we praise your name that you travel to all of our hearts in whatever state we are in, tearful or joyful, and you cause us to say, Glory to God in the highest heaven. We pray all these things in the Christ of Christmas, in whom we believe, and who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Hello, friends, and Merry Christmas Eve! I know some of us had hoped to travel to be with loved ones for Christmas, and our plans changed. But we're so glad you've traveled here to your computer to spend Christmas Eve with us. Speaking of traveling, when my son was a toddler, he was obsessed with an old rolling suitcase that we had. He would spend an hour or more walking back and forth with this suitcase in tow. And when I'd ask him, where are you going? He'd always reply, going on a trip. <laughs> I'm not sure how he got the travel bug, but it certainly bit him early. He's always loved to travel, whether by car, plane, boat, or train. In fact, I remember watching him as he boarded for his first train ride when he was four years old. His eyes were as big as saucers, taking in every detail around him, from the taller than normal steps to the backward facing seats. And when we finally started moving, he could hardly contain his amazement as the landscape whizzed by. We spent a lot of that trip exploring the train. And whenever he would come upon something new, and he didn't know what it was for, you know, like a button or a lever or a sign, he'd slow down and I'd watch his little brow furrow while he tried he, to figure out what it was. And if he couldn't, he'd turn and ask me, and then he would listen intently as I explained its purpose. Now, he didn't always understand everything I told him because he was four, but he did seem satisfied with the answers I gave him. I think I had as much fun watching him as he did encountering these new surroundings. I marveled at how he approached everything with an attitude of genuine curiosity and unquestioning acceptance of my answers. You know, this reminds me of Mary and Joseph. They were living a pretty normal life until God took them on the trip of a lifetime. From the beginning, they faced unexpected challenges. Some wonderful, like when the angel told Mary that she would be our Savior's mother. Some frightening, like when they escaped from King Herod. And some almost too much for a heart to take, like watching Jesus die on the cross. And then seeing him alive again. Through it all, they trusted that God had a plan and a purpose for each step on their journey. And when they couldn't figure out why something was happening, they knew they could reach out to God for answers, even though they might not understand them right then. Some call this an attitude, some call this attitude childlike. I think it's because most adults struggle to have it. But it's exactly the way God wants us to approach him, with wonder and faith, curiosity about why a situation or a person is in our life, and unquestioning acceptance that his answer is sufficient. This year, we've all been on quite a twip, and it's not over yet. But no matter what you encounter in 2021, I hope that you'll have the same attitude of curiosity at the places God takes you, and that you'll seek and accept God's answers. Because no matter how we get there, we already know our final destination. Will you pray with me? Dear God, thank you for the gift of Jesus. Just like Mary and Joseph, would you give us childlike hearts as we walk through this coming year so that we can embrace every opportunity and challenge with curious minds and unwavering faith in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So in June of 2019, my wife and I celebrated our 25th wedding anniversary. And Shannon has just been this incredible 
a gift to me. She's put up with me. She's traveled with me. She's uh, been an incredible spouse and, and has served in the church in so many ways. And I'm just so grateful for that. Uh, but we knew that, that June of 2019 was going to be a busy year for us and busy time of year for us. And um, particularly because our son was graduating from high school. He actually graduated on the day of our, of our wedding anniversary. And then he's going to be moving to Spokane to start college at the end of August. And we had kind of a, a busy summer already. And so we, we said, well, let's celebrate our anniversary a little bit later. And then we said, well, when, when is a good time to, to go? And we looked at the fall, but the fall was already busy. And the fall in the church is actually extremely busy. And I said to Shannon, you know, let's just, let's just push it off and, and, and do something next year. And, and, um, but we, we decided on where we wanted to go. And so we just, we, uh, picked a place called Turks and Caicos, which is about 600, 700 miles, um, south of Miami and, and in between the Bahamas and Haiti and the Dominican Republic and this incredible series of islands. And, and we actually couldn't find very many people who had gone there, but the people who had been there had said it was absolutely stunning and absolutely amazing. So we're like, this is where we wanted to go. And so then we started trying to figure out, well, when should we go? And we knew our kids had uh, January break and spring break, and and I had Easter. And so we finally landed on saying, Let, let's go at the end of April. And so we made arrangements, flight arrangements, and we made uh, hotel arrangements and had it all sorted out because we thought, what could go wrong with pushing back our anniversary celebration to the spring of 2020. Well, if you haven't been paying attention yet, you probably are now paying attention and thinking, what exactly did Paul just say? So in case you missed it, we pushed back our 25th wedding anniversary celebration that was in June of 2019. We moved it to April of 2020, thinking this would be a great time to travel. And then we know what happened. COVID hit. And so instead of prepping for a trip to go to Turks and Caicos to celebrate 25 years of marriage in the month of April, I spent the month of April canceling all of our reservations and trying to get our money back. It was a very strange way of thinking about, is this really how we spend the time celebrating 25 years of marriage? I've been calling the year of 2020 the year we didn't travel. My wife, in homage to Harry Potter, has been calling the year 2020 the year that must not be named. Because it has been a strange year. The fact that I'm sitting in a room in our studio here, looking into a camera, talking to you and wishing you all a Merry Christmas when it's just me and the camera is weird. I would have never imagine that. I don't think even when we went under the restrictions in March that any of us would have ever thought we would be in December and I'd still be f- preaching in front of a camera. And I have to tell you, it doesn't get any easier. I, I, I get it and I know it's what I need to do and I love being able to do that. And, um, but but it, it's just strange and, and we're all living in this strange time. But I don't want to talk tonight about the strange time. I want to talk about traveling. And, and, and the sense of you know, I, I love to travel. And, and I looked back at my calendar this year and I realized the only traveling I have done has been on the West Coast. I've been in California and in Oregon and in Washington, taken some flights and driven some miles. And that's been it because we're just not really traveling like we used to. We aren't even traveling to see our parents. We didn't travel at Thanksgiving. We're not traveling at Christmas. And so there's this, this, this odd sense. And then, as many of you probably did, I got this wonderful, incredible um, alert a couple of, probably a couple weeks ago now from the state of California and got it on my phone. And here's what it said. New public health, stay-at-home order in your area. COVID-19 is spreading rapidly. Stay home except for essential activity. Wear a mask. Keep your distance. Stay home. Wear a mask. Keep your distance and a Merry Christmas to you. I mean, how strange is that? That when we are used to traveling and being with family, we're being told to stay at home, to play it safe, which we need to be doing. But in this Christmas season, I want to remind us that God continues to travel. Now, I was tempted 
to do a Christmas message from the Gospel of Mark. And I'll tell you something, you rarely, if ever, will hear a Christmas message from the Gospel of Mark. And I wanted to do it for this reason, because Mark is what I call the non-traveling gospel. In the Gospel of Luke, we get to hear about the shepherds, and we're going to read about them in just a moment. In the Gospel of Matthew, we hear about the Magi who are looking for Jesus. In the Gospel of John, which we read when we do Silent Night and, and light the candles, we, we read that the, that the Word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. The Gospel of Mark has none of that. Here's how the Gospel of Mark begins. The beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God, and then it goes straight into John the Baptist. No infancy narrative, no preparation. It just starts with the adult Jesus. But, you know, I don't want to preach from the gospel of Mark on Christmas Eve. I want to preach from the gospel of Luke. And I want us to think about all the traveling that was happening in the gospel of Luke. We're going to look at 20 verses. It's a lot of verses, but they're important verses. And and just as I read this, they're familiar words. But think about everybody who was on the move. And then we're going to talk about some of those people. So this is the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2, verse 1. We read this. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. And we talked about this uh, last Sunday. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths, placed him in a manger, because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. This is what happens when angels show up, folks. There is terror. Every time an angel shows up, these same words are spoken. Fear not. The angel said to them, verse 10, the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause a great joy for all people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly a great company of the heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, The shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. Did you catch all the people that are traveling in this narrative in Luke chapter 2? It begins with a census. And we think about a census, but why would would we have this census? Well, the census is basically to to be able to tax people. So everybody is moving in the Roman Empire, and Joseph and Mary, they have to travel to Bethlehem because that's where the family of Joseph is from. So they're on the move to Bethlehem. They make it to Bethlehem. Jesus is born, and then, and, and then the angels are on the move. The angels are on the move from heaven to earth to announce this great news. The first angel says, this is incredible thing has happened. The, the, the Savior has been born. And then the chorus of angels, I love this. It just, it, the, the volume grows because they start singing glory to God in the highest heaven and on peace and on earth peace on those whom his favor rests. And it moves from the voice of one to the voice of many. So the angels are traveling from the heavens to the earth. And then the shepherds travel to go and see the infant Jesus. People are on the move. God is on the move. God has been traveling. 
God has arrived in the form of Jesus Christ. And the shepherds say to each other, let's go and see this thing that has happened. And I always wonder, what did that conversation look like? We hear about what, that, what happened after they had seen the baby Jesus. But we don't really know what they talked about on their way there. They had, they had had this incredible appearance of the angels in front of them, singing to them, telling them of everything that had happened. And then they, they go. They don't sit there. They travel to go and see what has happened in Bethlehem. And, and, and really for them, I mean, they're out there working. They make an incredible detour. But what they discover in making that detour of going out of their way, of traveling to the city of Bethlehem, they see that this detour is actually more of a U-turn. It's not a dead end. And so they go and they see Mary and Joseph and the infant Jesus. And something happens to them. Something changes in them. Something new and wonderful that they had not seen before. Their lives were not great being shepherds. They were outcasts. They were not really welcome. They were, they were seen as part of, the, of, a, of a lower class. And, and their lives, you know, they, they, were, they were watching and waiting as well. They were wanting something better than what they had. And the angels go to them first and say, a Savior who is Christ the Lord has been born. And so they make a detour. They go out of their way to go to this manger. And for us in our lives too, I think that the import, there is an important aspect of life that we don't always like that's called a detour. That sometimes God allows us to, to kind of go off the road or God pulls us off the road sometimes to have us stop for a while and to, to look and to listen and to learn. Because what the shepherds saw changed them. They realized that God had traveled for them. That the angels had announced to them the good news. And so in the midst of travel bans or travel, only essential travel allowed, don't forget that God's still on the move. Because we, we, we need to hold on to those traditions that we can. And, and I recognize that, that this year has made a lot of that very difficult. One of the things I'm bummed about is our family for who knows how many years has, we, we will get in the car, we drive down to Balboa Park, and, uh, and, and we go take a look at this guy. Um, you, you may be familiar with this person on the screen, a guy by the name of the Grinch. And we know the story of the Grinch. And the Grinch hated Christmas. And he looked down on Whoville and got sick and tired of them always celebrating and all their singing. And so he comes up with this great idea that he's going to steal Christmas. But to do that, he has to travel as well, right? Because everyone's moving. So he loads up, he, or he gets in his sleigh, and he grabs Max and dresses him up like a reindeer instead of the dog that he is. And they sneak their way into Whoville, and they steal Christmas. And the Grinch can't wait until the next morning. When all the people in Whoville wake up and discover that Christmas is gone, it's been stolen. But you all know the story. The Grinch goes out to listen, and the people are singing. Both tall and the small are singing the song. And the Grinch cannot figure it out. And so you know these lines, and I would try and do them from memory, which I might be able to do, but I don't want to take a chance on that. But here's what he realized. He says, he hadn't stopped Christmas from coming. It came. It came without ribbons. It came without tags. It came without packages, boxes, and bags, or bags. And he puzzled and puzzled till his puzzler was sore. Then the Grinch thought of something he hadn't before. What if Christmas, he thought, doesn't come from a store? What if Christmas, perhaps, means a little bit more? What if Christmas, perhaps, means a little bit more? 
And we know that truth. We know that pandemics, travel restrictions, social distancing, wearing of masks, doesn't keep Christmas from coming. Because a Savior has been born, who is Christ the Lord. That is our hope. That's what this day, this evening is all about. That Christmas comes, that we continue to sing the songs, that that cannot be taken away from us. And so what Christmas is saying to us is that Jesus has made the trip for you. Jesus has made the trip for me. Jesus has has traveled from the the outer reaches of the heavens, from being in perfect communion with God, to come and commune with us, his people. People who perhaps have lost their way. And the shepherds go. And they take this detour, if you will, to Bethlehem. And their lives are forever changed. John chapter 1, verse 14 puts it like this. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. The shepherds saw this little child. And their lives were U-turned. Nothing would ever be the same again because they had gone out of their way to see Jesus. And so for us, this Christmas, as we look forward, I, I want to encourage you, either today or tomorrow, to take a little detour to the manger of Jesus. To find a place You don't have to travel to do this, but just to find a place where you can just sit and realize what God has done for you in Jesus Christ. You may have lost hope this year. You may be extremely discouraged. You may be extremely encouraged. Wherever you find yourself on that spectrum, here's what I want you to know. That Jesus has traveled for you. He loves you more than you could ever ever possibly imagine. He sees you. Even if you feel you feel as though you can't see him, he sees you, he knows you, and he loves you. So take a little time. Make a little detour to see the one who has traveled for you the one who ultimately gives his life so we might have life abundant and life everlasting. Pray with me, please. God, on this Christmas Eve, we we hear the familiar story. We experience it in a different way this year, but we experience it in a different way every year. But Lord, I don't want this just to be words for us. I don't want these songs that we sing just to be songs. I long for all of this to point to the Messiah who has saved us, the one who gives us hope. And so, Lord, open our eyes to your great truth. Some of us need to, Lord, ask you to be a part of our lives. Others of us need to to know more of the joy that you offer to us. Wherever we find ourselves, Lord, Give us time to pause, to take a little detour, to see the beautiful, wonderful Savior born for us, and then, Lord, to return with joy and thanksgiving, singing songs of praise. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen.
Merry Christmas, La Jolla Presbyterian Church family. Merry Christmas, church. Merry Christmas, church family. Christmas church family. Merry Christmas, beautiful church family. Merry Christmas, Tony Penny. Merry Christmas to you and yours. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas, friends. Merry Christmas to you all. Merry Christmas, church. Our staff would like to wish you all a Merry Christmas. We're grateful to be on this journey with you. I invite you now to light your candle. From the Gospel of John, the mystery of the Incarnation. 
In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Friends, we have sung the familiar carols. We have lit candles to remind ourselves that light comes in the darkness. We have sung Silent Night. And after I give the benediction, uh, we've got one more carol. We've got Joy to the World uh, because we want to celebrate there is joy in this world. That joy is something that is deep seated, it is, it is not based on circumstances, it's not happiness. 
It's that which we found, find in Jesus Christ. It, it points to the peace that surpasses all understanding. That joy is deep-rooted in the hope that we have in Christ. So uh, stay tuned after this. Join us in the singing of joy to the world. And now receive our Lord's blessing. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all both now and forevermore. Amen.